Good morning and greetings from CSW and GEO. We wanted to welcome you to our session on expanding the online gender-based violence fight, addressing digital exploitation with male allies in tech in global South context. As we know, the digital revolution continues to promise empowerment to women, girls, and marginalized populations in older diversity. However, gender inequality seems to be engineered into the very algorithms that run the internet the weakness of the governance and accountability attached to it, and the toxic norms that are often promoted on it. Such inequality is deeply felt by women and girls, particularly in the global South. And during this panel, we will examine some of those realities women and girls face. We will concretely talk about the ways that online platforms become arenas for exploitation that exacerbate gender-based violence, whether it's cyber, harassment, political violence, to the perilous connection between technology and human trafficking. We hope today to talk about those issues, ignite awareness, and advocate for interventions to eradicate digital exploitation and online gender-based violence with particular attention for an urgent call to make male allies in tech to step forward and end tech-facilitated GBV in all its forms. In the words of the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, states must uphold the obligation of due diligence and the principle that human rights protected offline should also be protected online. In that spirit, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Silly Moore, and I work with the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, which is an international nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that promotes democracy worldwide. One of the issues that we care and work on very closely is making sure that more women can enter and participate in politics and political processes and public life. And yet, over the Recent years, we've noticed that with increasing rates of online violence against women, many women in politics are either leaving political life, and other women, particularly young women, are deterred from even entering it. The idea that politics is dirty, and so part of the cost is that you will be abused and harassed online is something that we don't think should be the cost of any job much less the job where women are seeking to promote the interest of their constituency. Moreover, it's often more women than men who tend to face that kind of vitriol online. We've done studies in different countries around the world, and it's always more women than male politicians who face those threats. And in particular, what we're calling violence against women or gender-based violence online the gendered aspect of it has to do with either those insults or abuse or threats are geared at women because they're women, or they're gendered in nature, with, let's say, uh, innuendos about their sexual lives, about their appearance, about their parenting skills, very much related to them as women. And also we see that as intentional in a political strategy to exclude women from the political process. And without women in the political process, of course, no political process can be seen as inclusive or democratic. So with that in mind, I wanted to introduce to you a panel of five really interesting points of view on this issue in alphabetical order. Uh, Eduardo Correa is the co-executive director of TEDIC, which is the Association of Technology, Education, Development, Research, Communication established in 2012 in Paraguay. It focuses on civic technology and human rights protection on the internet, including cultural rights and knowledge through Creative Commons licenses. And he's sitting over there to the far left. Welcome. Next to him is Kamaswat Chantavisuk Kam, who is currently a partnership and advocacy specialist with the Civil Society Division at UN Women. Kam has more than 40 years of experience working on gender equality and ending gender-based violence on national, regional, and global levels. He also worked as the coordinator of the Regional Learning Community for Transforming Less Communities for Gender Justice in East and Southeast Asia. Next to him, I guess I'm going 
also the uh, alphabetical order. So we can be in order of, of people seated is Kat Townsend, who is an expert advisor with the World Wide Web Foundation, the Web Foundation. She has devoted her career to government transparency, collaboration across global partners, and improving technical capacity in the social sector. She also worked on data-driven prioritization of delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine in low and middle income countries, strategic development of civic tech for social accountability, and data transparency and civic engagement. Formerly also worked with USAID and the State Department here in the United States under President Obama's Innovation and Transparency um, Initiative. And next to her is David Gallion. Daniel, sorry, Gallion. Sorry. I just renamed you. David, you know. You love it? Okay, you can. Yeah, I can tell you how to legal change it. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Gallion, of course, is the Senior Director and Chief of Staff at Payoneer, which is a, a global payment platform. He works to set the strategic vision for the company's risk and compliance. In that role, he helps guide the company's strategies at the crossroads of technology and finance. He also works on how tech companies can address pressing social issues such as gender-based violence, and of course, in particular, the use of digital transactions in contexts like human sex trafficking. He's also been working and is an expert on collaborating with industry partners to develop robust content moderation policies and integrating safety features into digital platforms. Welcome, Daniel. And last but not least <laughs> is Ali Gagalang, who is the Executive Director and President of Breaking Silence Movement, which is a nonprofit organization committed to advocating for gender equality and empowering marginalized voices. She also brings over a decade of experience in the tech industry in Silicon Valley. That unique perspective informs her work in advancing, advancing social justice causes. She's also the co-founder of Hiraya Media, a digital media company that amplifies the unrepresented voices and promotes meaningful dialogue and narratives surrounding Filipino culture. Welcome all. So let's start with you, Ali. This organization, your organization, Breaking Silence Movement, which started in the Philippines and has grown into a global association on gender-based violence programming that really seeks to connect GBV survivors to services and progress. What could you share about the scope and, and breadth of online or tech-facilitated exploitation, harassment, and online GBV generally, especially against <coughs> girls in the Global South? And what have you seen are the impacts of that? Thank you, absolutely. Um, what we've seen at Breaking Silence Movement, movement is that it, the issue is far simpler though we've, we've previously discussed. It always boils down to poverty, right? Um, with almost 23% of Filipinos uh, li living under the poverty line, that's 25.2 million people um, who think basic necessities are a luxury. Um, and so that's just how it is right now in Manila. It's, it's not something like the food and uh, water, shelter, clothes, it's just something that they have to scrounge, scrounge money for, you know, it's not something that they actually, like, money that they have, it has to be set aside to be able to afford these things. On the contrary, on the other hand, surfing, inter internet surfing is so easy to access in the Philippines. That's um, an hour of internet surfing at an internet cafe and costs about 15 pesos to um, 35 pesos, that's 30 dollars, 30 cents to 60 cents in the Philippines. So it's far to, it's so, it's easily accessible. And so, um, and on, in the contrast, like I said, um, food is, uh, hard to come by. A kilo of rice is, um, 40 pesos, uh, per kilo. That's probably, that's a dollar, roughly. And one kilo of rice lasts only a day for a family of five. And that's just rice alone, right? So they don't have access to, it's hard to buy vegetables, meat, with just, you know, uh, a small amount of salary. 
right? So that hunger that they feel, that desperation that they feel, in order to survive, right? They will do anything um, to do. They will do anything means necessary to to just get money, extra money, to be able to afford this food, right? And, in saying that, the primary um, victims of this abuse are not marginalized community. Um, and so, in not, not just in the Philippines, but in the global south. Um, so they're very vulnerable to tech-facilitated gender-based violence so, because they go to the internet and see, you know, the demand sometimes for just, like, implicit, explicit um photos of women and girls that they can easily sell and get money off of, right? And um so it turned the this this desperation they can they get act they go uh they like I said means that any means necessary and even exploiting to ex exploiting their own children to to just um get money and um be able to afford this food, and that's the gravity of the situation. Um, so while the issue is very straightforward, right, it's very multifaceted. It's a ecosystem of stakeholders, including household members, which is the prim primary victims of this on um, online gender-based violence, and then of course the government, who, um, the government who is responsible for policy making policies laws and regulations, government initiatives, and also the private sectors who, in an ideal world, of course, they should be our allies, but sometimes they're not, because sometimes, like, we live in a capitalistic company, like, you know, uh, uh, world, right? So sometimes what they do is that they, um, they put money over anything else, even social justice. Right, so in an ideal world, they should be an ally. But um, which is which is this panel is a great um, this panel is assembled greatly just because it's about time that we talk about allyship in tech, male allyship in tech, and with people who work, people like us who work in um, women's rights and um, gender based violence. Um, and you've also asked about the impacts of you know. Um, online gender-based violence in marginalized communities, and more often than not, it's not physical at all. It's sometimes it's, tra it's trauma, it's PTSD, um, perpetrating violence, stalling societal um, progress by normalizing harassment, um, perpetrating discrimination and immortalizing stereotypes. Um, this means that um, regression hampers collective advancement and perpetuates a cycle of poverty. Thank you so much. And as you were talking, I was thinking of the research that India has done with women and political parties. And what they often say is that the majority of the abuse and harassment they face is actually from other men within their own political parties, right? Sometimes it really comes from within the house, literally. Um, Cam, if you don't mind, I'll go next uh, to you. As I mentioned, you dedicated more than 14 years um, of your career to ending gender-based violence at different levels and now with you and women. You also coordinated a regional network of activists seeking to transform masculinities for gender justice in East and Southeast Asia, including in your home country of Laos. In your work with men and on masculinities, what have you seen in terms of harmful norms and the interplay between the online to offline gender-based violence and the impact that you've seen both on men and women? Thank you. Risk factors for men use of violence, which is perpetrations, and risk factors for women's experience of violence, which is victimizations, are very similar between online and offline violence. So, in our work, we have seen a lot um, the connection between the two um, settings of violence and two contexts. So, the harmful masculine behaviors or attitudes that are prevalent in offline setting that can lead to violence um, in communities and families are very prevalent in the online setting too. And also, it's interesting because online setting can be such a anon anonymous space for expressions um, and 
this behavior can even be exacerbated in the online setting. So we, we have seen non-violent boys and, and men in, 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 in offline setting would become very violent in online setting because there is this anonymous space for expressions. This is a very tricky point because in our region and in, in, in many parts of the world um, where democratic and civic space are shrinking for people to participate and online have become a, a very free a space for, for participation and expressions which is um, uh, what we needed in a very uh, shrinking space um, setting. But at the same time, it also creates this um, unsafe space for, for many people to experience. So, certain behavior that we have seen for men in offline settings, for example, for um, controlling behavior, uh, um, during dating, for example, uh, boyfriend checking girlfriend's uh, mobile phone, uh, us using application to track where the, the, the girlfriends are. Um, that type of controlling behavior can, can lead to inter intimate kind of violence in offline setting. But that type of behavior can also exaggerate of life setting by using technologies or devices to control her, for example. Um, and, and we also have learned that it's harder to, to, to police or to monitor what's happening because online space is it's borderless. So now it allows men and boys to conduct some behavior beyond their own space, their, their physical space. For example, a, a person in Laos can bully another person in Thailand, or a person in the Philippines can go online and shame another person in Vietnam. So in that context, it's harder to work in addressing different forms of practices across these borders because we don't have a clear division and ways of monitoring and controlling this online space. Um, and interestingly, um, I just read an article that came up literally a, a couple of weeks ago on the economies. I don't know if you have seen called the Angry Men, uh, Angry Young Men, where um, the economists conducted a survey in European countries, South Korea and China and the UK, and they have found that younger men are more conservative than older men, and younger men now support the, the idea that feminism has gone too far. The younger men and men have found this online space, which is called Menosphere, where they gather to express their anger, to express the, the, the bitterness of, um, of their life due to poverty, due to unemployment, or what, whatever they perceive has been taken away from them. Um, so again, online space has become this space for men to in, reinforce each other, and it has become so global because we are talking the, the conversation is about co global south context, but the the online space doesn't have the global north or global south context in a sense because there's a, there can be connection between men across the world to share similarities and share their anger and they reinforce each other and um, and this has become. Uh, quite a, a dangerous space for 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 gender based violence. Um, so yeah, just to to mark it there. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Pam. I think the study also talked about how within young men and women, young men seem to be more conservative than, than the young women, right? So they're talking about there's the same age of generation, but the women are sort of growing more progressive and liberal, and the men seem to be growing 
you know, more conservative and, like you said, kind of a backlash. Um, Daniel, <laughs> as a senior executive uh, of a company at the crossroads of technology and finance, what do you advise te tech companies can do to address gender-based violence? And I'll just add that I just uh, noticed that, for example, Meta will be shutting down crowd people which was sort of a scraping tool that a lot of researchers, including us, were using to really, <clears throat> excuse me, identify harmful content and misinformation and gender harmful information. And the fact that this tool will not be available anymore, at least in the context of Facebook and Instagram, right, suggests uh, a movement away from transparency. So it would be wonderful to sort of hear from your perspective um, what can tech companies do to address GBV? And then specifically in your company, which is a global payment platform, how do you address the use of digital transactions in GBV context, specifically or, or particularly in the context of sex trafficking? Um, great questions. Um, as, as a tech executive, I will preface this by saying um, a lot of the North Star metrics for product is specifically around utilization, is specifically around uh, margin, total margin, revenue associated with the product. It doesn't actually contextualize the underpinnings of like how users are utilizing it and the thematics around the consequences of such a product. So I'll preface it by that. I will say that it's not enough for tech companies to just issue up community guidelines for their users. It's, it's just simply not enough. Um, we've seen across the board in the tech space a proliferation of trust and safety teams. Uh, trust and safety teams are basically an augmented layer of operations that really try to content moderate. But as you can imagine, across many social media platforms, we're talking about millions of users. So how can we address and automatically review these millions of users on a daily basis to really combat GBV-based content? So it's a million-dollar question, right? I've seen solutions around scraping, right? Um, I've seen solutions around uh, tolerance around risk. So a lot of what how content is rated is basically on core tenants, right? Like, is it are there keywords in the content that specifically um, you know refer to GBV as an example? There's subtext within images that highlight you know if if you ever save a picture on your computer, you'll notice like there's subtext behind it. So that's another way we can look at it. I think it's it's. It's, it's not enough to just have a trust and safety team. I think what we're seeing in the tech industry now is, as, as I, I don't want to call this a buzzword because I, I, I really think this is really going to be impactful, is the, uh, the usage of AI, uh, specifically generative AI. If you think about a company trying to content moderate millions of users, right, it's not enough to just hire outsource workers to review this content, right? Um, it's not enough to just really, like, like I'm talking like, you gotta spend like two seconds per um, per message or per image, right? What we're seeing for, from AI is like, obviously from a guidelines risk scoring uh, perspective, right? So adding that layer to your community guidelines, um, you're able to have more targeted interventions, right, uh, from a trust and safety perspective. What I mean by that is, you know, creating algorithms, right, associated with your AI to really pick up these subtexts and really focus on how can the company be more proactive in their interventions. Because what I've seen in, in talking to my, my peers in the industry is that, like, Oftentimes, it's a little too late. When, when actions happen from users, when images and articles or any type of um, messaging that's a deviation from the community guidelines is issued, it's already too late for us, right? So I think, I think the, 
how we address this in the tech industry is like, how can we close the gap of making sure that intervention is timely, right? Because it's not enough to just, you know, from a technology perspective, we see it as an exception in our systems. We see it as an exception. Okay, let's resolve this. Do we need to ban the user? Do we need to keep the user and like figure out like how the user is linked to multiple accounts? Because platforms can see relationships between accounts. And you know, users will build sub accounts in and Cam talked about this. There's a lot of anonymity, right? But like everyone has one IP address. That's their that's their that's their ID. Yeah. And so looking at the relationships, closing the gap of intervention time, really, really targeting that is really what's gonna get technology and platforms in the social media space really active especially in addressing the GBV uh, context. Um, and then specifically around payments. So um, I'm going to address how we screen for payments and uh, at a more general level, and I think this is applicable to a lot of payment companies globally. We screen for users that, have, that has a history of potentially participating in human trafficking. We work with regulatory agencies globally. We partner with them to, 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 to think about ways in which we can adjust our monitoring, our algorithm, to not only think about sanctions, to not only think about like, hey, is this user doing um, um, payment activity that's beyond our guidelines? We partner with them to really get the insight around is there illicit activity? Um, and so from a payments perspective, every user is screened, obviously from a KYC perspective, but more importantly, I think the key issue here and is something I want to be up for, upfront with is there is partnership behind the scenes with, with regulatory agencies to really address like how we define illicit activity, yeah. like trafficking, right? and identifying those core signals with our users from a payment perspective. If we see recurring payment activity that is coming from an IP address in Asia but is paying out to another part of Asia, but there's no story behind it, we can see those trends. We can flag those trends. And that is something that, from a payment perspective, we're, we're constantly getting better at. So um, I will say, to conclude, um, from a payments industry perspective, we are always actively removing users that are promoting illicit activity, that are moving money uh, to promote illicit activity, and it's always in the best interest, not only for our for the company and the integrity of the financial system, but it's in the best interest to protect our users and the privacy of our users. Thank you, Daniel. And I think we'll, we'll talk a bit more about algorithm and generative artificial intelligence because I think one of the issues I think some of you will probably bring up is around sort of the transparency and you know civil society and others being really able to know what what goes into those right into that thinking and how do we make sure that it's not uh, gendered or biased in other ways. Um, but now to Eduardo. As a researcher in technology innovation and digital to Digitalization. Thank you. In public policies, where do you see issues and gaps in technical and oversight teams at big tech companies and platforms, including in the context of product design and implementation, where they may be blind to issues of tech facilitated GDV or may actually be making the problem worse? Thank you so much. Um, I feel that perhaps I can start from an example that sort of like illustrates some trends that we've seen in, in, in certain tech platforms, and from there I can I can I can pull some answers, I guess. Um, so, of course, when GBV affects women and vulnerable populations in disproportionate ways, as we have seen so far, and the private sector has a duty uh, to promote human rights within its private sector initiatives, profit-driven as they may be. There are thresholds that they shouldn't necessarily uh, cross, and there are concerns that they should adopt 
whenever they are designing different products. And I think that what we see a lot in, in, in global south context, like the one that I come from, which is Paraguay, is that there isn't necessarily a malice, but there is a complete detachment of the reality in which the platform or the digital service is being implemented that ends up facilitating situations of abuse, situations of the waste violence, etc. etc. To give like just one very specific example, for example, uh, one specific um, illustration. In the gig economy, for example, uh, we are part of this network called the Fairware Network that evaluates labor standards in the gig economy, the enjoyment of labor standards specifically. So what we've seen is that the big platforms, uh, they change, of course, some of them are better than others, but one platform in particular that is a right handling platform, uh, whenever they're doing the registration of the worker, for example, and there are more and more female workers in this ecosystem and different types of workers, uh, they don't allow, whenever they're being registered, to declare a different sex rather than male and woman. So they limit the ability of the worker to express a different gender expression. And this, in turn, allows for clients to flag these workers as workers that are not matching the identity of that the platform is indicating from the worker, creating a situation of violence that ends up blocking the person's or the worker's account for several weeks, because then you also have the issue of appealing processes being moderated by computers most of the times and being too difficult to arrive at a human to illustrate the case in a more nuanced um, way. So, also, we've seen in the gig economy, particularly on transport apps, it's not necessarily um, an issue that is perhaps a design problem of the platform, but it's happening in the platform, and it's the issue that more and more we're seeing clients canceling um, women drivers under the argument that they are not uh, fitted for driving, for example, and thus they don't want to go in a ride with a woman. So they wait until the woman to come uh, at the post where it's going to pick up the person and then they cancel there without explanation and also without any sort of penalty from the platform uh, to the worker in particular. So I think those two examples show, uh, in my opinion, not necessarily a evil by design <laughs> approach of the platforms, but more a complete attachment between different groups that are working in a specific platform. We're talking about platforms with a lot of resources that could fit inclusive by design practices, privacy by design practices, and uh, partner with different organizations that can help them better understand how to facilitate a more inclusive registration process for its workers that then would not allow for situations of discrimination on behalf of their clients to their workers or the other way around also. Um, so I think that at the moment we could, in a way, at least argue that there is a level of discommunication between people who are designing the products and people who are doing the oversight of the community guidelines, the enforcement of the community guidelines, or even the design of the community guidelines, that doesn't fit that other process. And another thing that, that, that I think this particular example shows is that we're seeing that and I think what Daniel was saying I was curious to me, like all platforms create information on how people utilize their services, right? All of these examples that I've seen are things that most likely Uber can, uh, Uber and other platforms can uh, see happening within their platform and intervene. Let's say, okay, this is a male account that is only blocking female work, uh, female drivers on a constant basis in 100% of all cases. What, what's the story there? Should we perhaps flag something? Um, because this is not happening. This is not a possibility that is given to the worker who is only allowed to cancel X amount of trips before getting a penalty. Uh, because what the platform wants is that the service is to continue more and more. Um, so I think, and, 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 and not to finish, and to finish on our positive, no ideas. I think these examples could also show that it's easy to start thinking in inclusive by design practices that could merge the bridge or like bridge the gap between different uh, groups working within these platforms and better tune down their policies, both at the design implementation stage, at the oversight of the community guidance stage, and then also in terms of the monitoring of the behavior of different accounts and perhaps thinking in ways to intervene 
those situations by creating educational resources, by creating levels of, you know, flagging that one can do as a worker or as a client to protect oneself and have a quick answer and a quick appeal, appeal process that is satisfactory for any person that is in a situation of vulnerability. So yeah, I will stop there. Thank you, Eduardo. It's so interesting, right, that you know we're thinking of explicit harassment and violence shutting women out of these spaces, but it sounds like there are sort of these implicit gender norms of discrimination that are doing uh, the same thing in a way. And so Kat, from your perch at the Web Foundation, which uh, aims to advance the open web as a public good and a basic right, in a world where everyone has affordable, meaningful access to the web to improve their lives and where their rights are protected, <coughs> that sounds wonderful. Is that reality that we can reach? Given the disturbing rise in tech facilitated GBV, online abuse, harassment, discrimination, as we just heard, misinformation, malinformation, disinformation, a lot of it resulting in pushing women, um, activists, and political aspirants in particular away from the web and from public life. Give us some good news. Well, thank you so much, and thanks, panelists, for joining. It's uh, really an honor to be on. Um, this discussion with you all, and thank you all for joining today, too. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, so, Kat Townsend, and I'm from the World Wide Web Foundation. Uh, and so, to your question of do we have hope, um, I think uh, I'm going to channel and paraphrase a quote from a US president, which is Our problems are made by us, and they can be solved by us. Um, the way that the web, the internet, um, the internet between those two are presented as because it is a new technology and it's moving so quickly, it feels inaccessible or insurmountable. And I would offer that these are very similar problems that we've had throughout history. And every time we have a great new innovation, um, printing press, steamships, um, oh, what are some other good ones? Uh, <laughs> um, radio. And uh, so we can. Anytime you have um, a new force, a new power, uh, it can be used primarily targeting the most vulnerable. Um, that there is also a great potential there uh, to connect um, and bring empowerment uh, and advancement to the people who have been most marginalized. Um, that's what we try to do, and that's what we try to do through work with uh, research and policy advocacy. Um, and the founder of the organization actually invented uh, HTML invented websites. So the reason the World Wide Web has its name is because of um, an invention 35 years ago last week uh, by Ted University. And 35 years is very recent. Um, so I think it's quite exciting. As scary as these issues seem, uh, we are working in and living in a generation where we are shaping uh, something that is quite transformative. And I think it can be um, generative for ourselves, not for AI, but for ourselves, and feel joyful that um, that there's a lot of potential here. Um, so, uh, Sirtu or TBL, who goes by many different kinds of names, sent out a message last week on the anniversary, um, reflecting on his invention and why he invented the web was for everybody to have um, a space to convene, connect, and express themselves. So the web is the layer on top of the internet that actually physically connects everybody around yeah. the world and is sometimes disruptive. Um, but it is the visual layer that we all use in a more simple way to see each other and to connect with each other. And he invented that because he said it, this shouldn't just be for academics or for military, it really should be for everyone. So how do we work uh, to make that truly a reality? Um, the two points that he uh, uh, sort of flagged on is um, this monopolization from tech platforms to say you must use only our service in order to access online. And so people are really getting the experience of the web where it's not everybody's sharing their own expressions, it is through one company at a time. 
Um, so you can have a very rich fulfilling experience of your day using maybe three apps that are owned by one company and not really realize that those are also interconnected. Um, and then the other that he points to, uh, which was never the design or the idea, the idea is that every one should have had an equal voice. Um, and the other thing he points to is this cycling of data and of personal data. That the way that uh, That's true. the way that the web works now is this idea that you have to collect data, you have to amass data, you have to build profiles of people in order to create a service. And so, with apologies for the space, but Daniel, the way that you've presented the solutions in the company, which is just interesting, is that let's build profiles of the people who are using the product, which I, you know, it makes sense to do, but there's also a question of how do we, how could we create these organizations where by design we're not collecting that data, or it's easier for people to choose pathways um, where they're not getting cycled, not getting radicalized into violent misogyny. Um, can we construct a web and can we can support organizations, whether it's society or government or private sector, um, where it is less easy to uh, to go down the pathway of, um, of violence. And I think that's what we are working on. And you can work on that through the web and you can also work on it, as Khan has said, these are offline problems have online parallels, offline solutions have online parallels. Get women leadership in. Um, have uh, more people who are diverse having that science and technology education so they can have those leadership roles. And by the way, have some art and philosophy and literature thrown in there because if you only have tech mind, then you only have tech solutions. And we need these diverse leaders and solutions in there. And we need them in uh, our, our company roles, we need them in civil society, and we need them in governments because there's a lot of people in governments that rely on the private sector for the solutions because they don't have the knowledge themselves. And so um, we need a better pipeline and we need better leaders and that will help a lot. Thank you. This is a good segue to talking more about some of those solutions and interventions that seem to be working, particularly in bridging the gap between sort of the technical oversight teams and tech companies in what civil society and grassroots advocates are advocating for and what women and men are experiencing. So, Kim, if I could go back to you, given your experience working with men on masculinities and GBV, what do you think tech, especially male tech allies, should be more aware of, and what can they do about it? Um, I think a lot of um, points have been brought up by, by the colleagues sitting here. But I think, first of all, male tech allies or tech company need to realize that they have the responsibility on this issue beyond their products. Conversations about um, by design process has to think about the implication before before they design the product. The tech companies now are so powerful and they're so prominent in, because technology is so prominent in our life. Technological products are no longer just just products. They they are devices in our livelihood. So tech company need to realize that whatever they, they decide, there will always be political, social, and cultural um, uh, implications of the product. So that needs to be considered in, in, in their work, in their job. It's not only about making products and making money from the product, but the responsibility that the, the tech company, companies have toward our society. Secondly, so like what, what colleagues here were saying as well, is that it's, it's very important that male alliance um, and tech companies specifically need to have conversation with women and girls, civil society organizations, and all those organizations that are working to in violence or to promote gender equality or promote diversity or in discrimination, because there needs to be a conversation how we can do this work together. Um, it, um, and then the, the, the expertise can be shared. 
and that the conversation can be had. Thirdly, the, in terms of bringing back to our, the topic of our conversation, which is specifically on the global south, and then Kat mentioned quickly just now about expertise and experience of the global south in dealing with it. While a lot of the work comes from the global north, so it can be feel so overwhelming in the global south context where there's not sufficient resources and capacity to deal with offline violence at the moment. And now we have to deal with online violence. And at the same time, there's not sufficient funding and expertise to deal with online violence, even in the developed country, uh, the, the global north context. And for this global south context, dealing with so many things, this is even more overwhelming and it's more challenging. So the tech company needs to be working in this view, the way that there needs to be support to the global south in dealing uh, on this issue because of the lack of capacity, expertise, and also funding. Um, and lastly, again, the connection between online and offline. Um, they cannot be separated because, so we don't have enough or uh, sufficient evidence of what works to prevent online violence because it's still new and there's not enough uh, documentation of what works and what do not work. However, we do know more about what works to prevent offline violence. And that means that work needs to be continued and to be pushed forward because those. Um, initiatives are aimed to address risk factors for offline violence, which I mentioned before, that are linked to online violence. So addressing offline uh, risk factors for offline help addressing risk factors for online. So they both have to go hand in hand and um, they cannot be separated. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. It makes me think of some of the work we've been doing um, on creating gender lexicons. So for example, with content moderation, how to really ensure that companies know the terms, which could be different in different languages and in different contexts, and sometimes they're coded words that really are actually very offensive terms. You know, how to really create that. You can create that without connecting to the women and girls in that community, right? So that's really interesting. And this idea of almost like a human rights assessment as you're creating a product. Um, so Ali, some of this might be familiar to you, having spent a decade in the tech industry in Silicon Valley, and now immersed in the experiences of women and girls girls facing online GBV in the Philippines and beyond, what have you seen as some promising intervention and where do you see gaps? Yes, um, in my experience in the Tech Valley, I've seen that it's observed, observed that women in tech is really important. Women, not only tech, but women in rooms that, you know, decisions are made are important, but as important as that men already in these rooms making decisions are advocating for women's rights right because it's some of these tech places they're male dominated some of them are men are already in higher places that make these decisions and so if they advocate for women's rights and issues then there is policy changes and it makes it a better product right so um these positive policies processes and beliefs um, it all ultimately results in, in products that don't facilitate the exploitation of people, especially those that are already in desperate situations, right? And um, addressing gender-based violence in online spaces requires, um, like I said in my previous um, in my previous answer, is that it, the issue is very multifaceted because it ha it's a whole ecosystem, and that's the same thing with um, solutions in tech. Just um, because we need to install safeguarding technologies, and you've, you've um, mentioned gener generative AI. Um, AI is great. Um, AI, because it makes a robust process or robust review, content moderation, that's great. But also, at the same time, it's not just a technological issue, it's a human empathy issue. And I think Kat has mentioned that as well, is that we have to put we have to hire people as well who cares a lot about these stuff, right? It's not just 
tech. It's just not about um, revenue. It's not about ROI. It's also how do I make things better? How do I make this um, space better? And in order to do that, is we have to install human empathy. And um, by what I mean is installing, it's a technical world, but installing human or hiring human be, be not human that are trained enough, not only that they care enough, but they are trained enough to um, moderate and don't let anything pass, right? I think that's a very important, not just the technical aspect of it. Um, so by combining automation with human empathy, it allows for creation of safer online environments for people, for kids, because sometimes, you know, there's so many kids nowadays who don't go out and just um, use their iPads and play and use social media, use TikTok, for example, right? The 13 year olds are in TikTok and they're so vulnerable to um, online gender based violence in that um, we have to have people um, in tech that are allies of making sure that we don't contribute, we don't contribute more to what is already happening. And, um, the, it, that helps mitigate the risk of more gender-based violence right now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that. And of course, there's the issue of the people, the humans during the moderation themselves then having the secondary trauma of having to view all of that, right? So there, it, it's, it complicates things for sure. Um, Eduardo, as a man in tech, <laughs> How do you generate support for more male allies in the tech industry to stop this kind of online GBV and gender disinformation? And as you mentioned, how to really integrate gender intentional approaches and enforcement policies for both private and public sector in mitigating this phenomenon? Thank you. <clears throat> and just to to to. To stretch a bit also what Ali was saying, I think that also in the in the current debate of generative AI, one thing that is very interesting is that um, all the data annotators are in very precarious working conditions that ends up also harming the moderational content as a whole. And it's something that is impacting this information, impacting the way um, automated sources are like flagging uh, malicious content of all sorts. And it goes back, or it goes back also to this issue of what I was saying, you know, poverty and how tech has different impacts in different regions based on socioeconomic status, based on race, class, and so many other uh, gender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I think that in terms of, um, of 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 how to support more male allyship, and I think allyship is also a very important word to to reflect, perhaps. Um, but first, I would say that with Interleague, which is kind of the, the, the work that we're doing uh, in trying to evidence the disparities that are currently existing in terms of male versus female presence in the tech space, in the public sector, is we have this project called Women Panel, which pretty much every time we see a panel in any space, we sort of like flag that in our website and we do a fun campaign about it and we reflect about what it means to see a table dominated only by men uh, talking about an issue as if there were no women that know about the topic nationally and internationally. Uh, this campaign is focused in Paraguay, so we do a lot of, of we follow a lot of like social media of like private sector companies, tech private sector companies, and government accounts who both in equal ways and in equal percentages have more men of them. than then panels that are more representative. Or then sometimes what you have is like this strategy of like all men, all men talking and then the woman is the moderator, right? So that's that's that, that's sort of like uh, what we've seen uh, because we see that the campaign is working. We see that people are worried not to be in that database. And it's an interesting way of, 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 of forcing in a way a reflection. And I think that to, to, to frame it in a more positive way, I guess, it's not an issue of creating these databases to make some sort of shaming uh, to, to, to these people who are doing work and that are not necessarily very trained or human empathetic enough to see those differences. Because you really do need to have a trained eye, unfortunately, still in this century, to understand those kind of disparities and what it means. What we want to do with this is with very visual campaigns 
evidence the situation and evidence that it is a problem and with that evidence you hopefully get more allies that are then training how to identify those issues how to flag whenever there is a disparity situation within their own companies or within the public sector uh, as a whole. Um, and I think that uh, we're in the process also of, to the point of the online versus the online, so far uh, this campaign has only been uh, conducted online. The idea is for this year to go out on the streets, do graffitis, talking about the online, online panels and what it means and what are the different implications. Um, and, and, and going to the issue of the um, of, of, of my reflection on, on the allyship, I think that it's very important that we get more and more male allies that are helping in evidence in these situations and, and the need for action internally in companies, internally also in government, and in the space wherever they are. But I think that they, that has to be done hand in hand with women in vulnerable communities because I think that. Allyship can be also very easily confused with championship. Um, and we've had a lot of discussions in this in, in, in marches in Latin America, like the 8th of March march or the 25th of November day, of, that is the day of, of fighting towards all, all forms of violence towards women, where, of course, men are very welcome to join the marches, men are very welcome to support uh, the, the, the event. But they are not to be in the front line uh, of the march, or they are not to be those having the microphone in those days. So they are there to support, to facilitate, to amplify those messages, but not take appropriation uh, of them necessarily. So I think that this would apply very perfectly to this scenario where we need those male allies in take space because they are the ones dominating right now the space. You go to a to a to a to the technical division of any tech company, and it's mostly men, most of the time. So we need those allies there, but we need those allies there to also flag the need of more uh, parity within their teams, to flag perhaps, or to be conscious about how a certain product that is only forcing one person to register as sex of women might bring, uh, as men or women might bring all sorts of problems in different communities, and especially in countries, for example, where there are no sex change laws. And, uh, sex name, uh, you know when you change your name, you're not in English. Um, like in Paraguay, for example, uh, we're not allowed to change our names or to change our gender, unfortunately. So trans women right now are forced to hold the legal identity with their dead name. Um, so um, I think that there is a big role here that platforms can take in creating more amicable and diverse spaces as the whole world is. And the other thing is, with um, female allyship, this, this thing that you were talking about, like how to promote more healthy masculinities and, and, and ideas and messages. There are many organizations that are working in these issues, like um, Men's Stop Break, for example, is an interesting example that we could potentially start thinking in how to bring some of those examples of promoting more healthy masculinities that are more sensible to different issues that are not necessarily male, quote unquote, um, to spear more allies in tech that can help us fight this, this issue. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, Daniel, I think you're a male ally in tech. I think we can call you that. <laughs> you're here. Um, tell us more about. <laughs> tell us more about what you've seen as effective interventions in bridging those gaps that we're talking about between the technical, the side teams, in tech companies and platforms, in civil society, grassroots advocates, and, and really working on gender-based violence and work, and then. If you could round it up with how you balance profit, technological innovation, and social responsibility as a tech company. So, I will say um, before I go in, I'm proud to work at a company that has 50% uh, of women in our executive committee. Our, our board of directors uh, is roughly 40 or 33% women. So, you know, in terms of the representation, that is something we think about even as a company. Like, the diversity of thought is so important as we, we get to decision making. Um, so, 
I wouldn't want to start by saying that I'm proud to work at a company that really cares about diversity. So in terms of like effective interventions, I will just briefly talk about um, a recent example, I think a, a year or two ago, at a, at a previous workplace where it was really the ERG, at the tech company, that raised this issue about how we onboard um, customers who actually want to use their dead name. Yeah. Oh, sorry. ERG, sorry. ERG is an employee resource group. So at every other, if, at, at every company, typically, like there's like affinity networks, right? Like, um, for example, uh, you can have like I was part of the parents network. Um, I was uh, at my previous workplace at a bank. I was part of the uh, the uh, Asian professionals network, the Hispanic Latino network, um, the LGBTQ network. Right? These are the ERGs or employee resource groups. So uh, on the topic of dead name. Right? When you're thinking about it from a product perspective, right, you have to think about the end-to-end -end value chain. Right? How do you onboard a customer with all these different providers in the value chain to be able to provide the services that your platform ultimately needs to provide? Right? And so it was actually the ERG, right? these uh, resource groups, these affinity work networks, specifically the LGBTQ network, that brought this issue up. And I think... Um, you know, when we talk about the human empathy that my colleagues here talked about, that's really an effective intervention because outside of profits, you have people who have come together with some common ground who are actually advocates of the users in some degree, shape, or form, right? So we looked at, there's, there's a full taxonomy of gender lexicons, right? When you think about it from a product perspective, these companies have to figure out scale, right? But again, contextualize the value chain, right? It's not enough for just the, let's say, a social media platform to actually affect the lexicon, whatnot. You have other dependent uh, supply chain providers, like you know the banking under the banking policy associated with their partner, their partnerships agreement with other providers. If we're talking about it from a payments perspective, like buy now, pay later, or direct payments, there's this whole ecosystem of like change that needs to happen in order to just affect one change. So the story I'm bringing up is just, I'll summarize it real quick. We had a number of rejected customers that wanted to use the red name. And we looked at the feasibility, we did a feasibility study, Obviously, we had to look at the percent of customers that are wanting to use this. There was the ERG was very, very pivotal in advocacy. Like I kid you not, I think you know it's it's great that any companies, employee resource groups have executive sponsors, right? And they do that because you know to the earlier point of my colleagues, it shifts away from championship to allyship, right? So this issue came up, and. Um, you know, obviously from a business perspective, we have to think about the ecosystem, but we also have to think about how we can scale the issue, right? Because we're talking millions of users, right? Fortunately, the solution we came up with was, let's have a manual review. Let's test it out. If the volumes of the users increase, right, and we're able to manage it without, a path, without hiring more people, without changing our infrastructure, Let's have that one-off solution. And so we do, right? And so users can actually go in. There's agreed MOUs across our providers to be able to say, hey, this user has provided the necessary documentation. I mean, we had to train our operations teams to, to be very sensitive, right? To ask someone like their dead name is very sensitive. And so from a technology perspective, you know, like, how you balance all of this is really around like leveraging the advocacy of ERGs or employee resource groups, but also thinking about like like how how you can make the product more broad in the context of ensuring that the agreements you have in the value chains are not disruptive. Because at the end of the day, right, like 
product doesn't look at these non-product considerations. And it's unfortunate. Should it happen more? Absolutely. But when you're thinking about it from a company perspective, you're looking at um, boundaries within local jurisdictions. So to the point of my colleagues earlier, some of the laws may not pertain to that. But if you want to be an inclusive platform, like how do you codify those different local jurisdictions? How do you balance uh, uh, you know, maintaining and supporting an ad hoc process, making it more scalable? And albeit the fact that this non-product consideration may not be as profitable, like how do you prioritize that? Right. And so balancing this is a is a tough act, but you know, as I mentioned before, one thing that worked for us in my previous roles is this the advocacy of employee uh, internal employee groups, right? It's the LGBTQ network that really drove the necessity of the solution. And I'm sure there are other alliances within tech companies, and it's growing. Um, you know, at my company, that we have a women's networking group, so we do talk about you know Women's History Month. How do we think about mentoring and coaching, right? Um, but again, in terms of like being an ally, affecting change at the tech level is very multifaceted, but it's possible. So, thank you, Danielle. It's Interesting, and I'm sure Kat will have more responses. But one of the one of the um, projects we worked on last year was talking to many civil society organizations who work around these issues, and overwhelmingly, they said what they needed was legislation and legally related approaches, as well as transparency, to really deal with some of those issues. And really requiring these kind of multi-stakeholder coalitions and strategies, right, that involve the companies, but also governments and civil society and media and judicial bodies. Um, that seems to be a really promising approach. Um, Kandia, for example, has been part of supporting the work of the Global Partnership for Action on Gender-Based Online Harassment and Abuse, which is a multi-government, um, multi-stakeholder platform with over a dozen uh, governments now, as well as Tech for Democracy initiatives, and there are others. And you know, it would be great, Kat, specifically, if you could talk, in addition to whatever other reactions you have, what are some global efforts that we should all be watching out for um, that could really give us some actionable strategies on how to address and mitigate uh, online gender-based violence and how to get more allies on board. Um, <clears throat> so, Celia, I think you said it really well, but it, it is how you get those multifaceted approach. How are you getting legal and how do you have um, uh, civil society groups? And I think one of the things that we're really encouraged by is the proliferation of coalitions and coalitions of civil society working together um, across different geographies, sharing information, sharing strategies. We're also seeing funders, the traditional funders, are more interested in supporting coalitions, which is great because, uh, as we know, uh, organizations in the global majority can do a lot with a smaller amount of money. Um, they, they deserve more. But um, but it's often the case that uh, the funds just go to larger organizations. And so being able to have coalitions is a way of getting uh, more input, more resources, and really distributing these strategies and power. And I think it's it's those kinds of, co of organizations that maybe um, could come into the conversations with uh, companies like the ones that Daniel runs, because for me, that was, it was such an interesting response to how are, how is civil society supporting the work that you're doing on TFGPD? And the answer was, we have internal processes and internal teammates. And it's great that Pioneer has more than 50% of the executives or women are at the center. A lot of companies don't have that. And so how do we demonstrate paradigms and models of tech companies that are participatory, that are transparent, as you said, and that, um, that are listening to and responsive to and accountable to civil society organizations? Because I think it is a very traditional model 
Um, as we've seen, it's a very traditional model to rely on minoritized groups within your company to affect change from within and advocate and hope that somebody will listen to them. That is not a scalable strategy. Um, and so it's one of the reasons that we have regulation and we have legislation and we require transparency from companies. Because it's not just unfortunate that um, product designers don't listen to others. It's, it's active and causing harm to be so siloed. Um, so we really do advocate for greater transparency and for um, you know those coalitions of civil society organizations working in, with uh, with feedback loops, with um, uh, sort of accountable and public processes. Um, how are you asking for their input? What input did they give? That can't be behind closed doors either. Um, how did you respond? How quickly did you respond? What's the demonstrated change on your platform? How can we measurably assess whether the change on your platform actually led to a change in experiences? Because that is a huge barrier that we have is we'll get responses from platforms and from governments, it's any that have a large power um, and a, a large user base. Uh, and they'll say, well, it looks very different. But we can't, we don't actually have the data from them to say, Here's how many people are saying they've been harassed. Here's what they're reporting. Um, all of that is still very much kept behind closed doors. So a lot of the, the data and transparency um, work is, is very necessary and needed. So I think uh, the civil so society coalitions are useful. And then, again, multifaceted approach, what is the UN doing? So we have the UN Global Digital Compact. Um, many of you may be involved in that process. Uh, there is a group. Their coalition is working on feminist and gender principles for the GDC, which you all are welcome to join, and getting um, governments to, to sign on to that. Um, there is the GEF out of UN Women, a uh, Generation Equality Forum that was announced three years ago. That is also amassing work around the world to try to uh, close barriers on, um, on access and on TFGBB. Um, there's also the global partnership that you mentioned. So I do think that none of this will happen, and there are tech coalitions of, of tech companies that are trying to work together with each other on how can they address um, these, these problems. So I think that there, we do have this multifaceted approach to sort of simplify it into top-down and grassroots, um, but that's needed, and it's needed for many different sides. What I will offer, what I've mean, seen in this past year Last year, we tried to get any traction on TFGBD, and it was really hard to do. There's not even a conference where we can convene. We're always sort of at the sides of events. That's starting to shift. We're starting to have spaces that are specifically dedicated to this issue. And as that proliferates, I think we really need to speak with one voice, not just about the harms online, but with what the, the, uh, the impact and the... Um, the growth and support that women can have when they have an equal space. Yeah. So we need to talk about leadership and the education and the economic growth that is untapped um, or under under realized. Uh, because if we only talk about it in a negative sense, then that's what we're seen as, and that's also the legal environment that we share with younger women um, and with men as well. As the point of this panel is uh, you want the online space to be seen as a place where we're really, really thriving, and so we need to tell that story and, um, and have that be the, the, the vision of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. This very much reflects what we always say, that if the digital ecosystem is not safe for women's self-expression, where they can express their views and perspectives, it's just not safe for democracy. Mm -hmm. right? So we really do see it as a systemic issue. I wanted to just open the floor for a few minutes. If you have reactions to each other or any other sort of closing remarks you wanted to offer. Sure. Sure. And of course, if any of you have any questions you'd like to pose, let me know and I'll pass the mic to you. And as, as, as you're thinking of questions, back. One second. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Anastasia Sagalavich. Thank you to all the panelists and the moderator for a fantastic panel. Um, I have a long question around something that was mentioned midway through the panel about looking at, it seemed to me like network analysis of behavior of users and um, identifying, identifying potentially um, um, suspect activities and linking that to the financial system. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about the um, the digital financial system in the sense that um, there is this um, new dawn of, let's say, perhaps um, digital payments that are beyond um, physical money, so digital currencies. And I was wondering if you can speak to um, perhaps inroads being made in that space where by design some of the systems are um, anonymous and that's a feature, not a bug. Um, and we do, we do know that we have network science and data science and machine learning, et cetera, that can um, flag certain things. But I wonder, um, we are to your point about having one IP address when there are different layers that are um, by design made to um, not be so public. I was wondering um, what your thoughts are around um, taking these techniques or maybe exploring new techniques to um, safeguard that space. Thank you so much again for every to everyone and um, really enjoyed learning from all of you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the question. I think it's uh, very timely. I, I, you know, I was my my intention with the statement was really to clarify that like the payment platforms are part of the ecosystem that moves money globally, right? And so what I mean by protecting the financial integrity, it's making sure the money is good money. It doesn't fund illicit activity. So in terms of network analysis and the kind of what we're, we're looking at, just broadly speaking here, uh, especially in the FinTech space, the network analysis is really aimed at identifying like, like relationships that would, um, that is very implicit. So, like, if, for example, um, we have this this framework of like tenant owner, right? So, like, if, for example, um, there are a thousand accounts, right, and the creation of those accounts were were timed or created within like one second of each other, as an example, or the movement of money is the same amount across all thousand accounts and moved within one day, that could tell us a couple things. It could know fraud, um, but what's gonna be helpful for us, and this really extends beyond like the profiling of these users is really around uh, scraping and, and supportability of these accounts. So look, a lot of like, a lot of users enter the platform day in, day out, right? I talk about the importance of scale and so, um, you know, it's really difficult to, to to manually review every thousand, every account of the thousand account setup. But I think what's important to note is how network analysis is utilized is really around scraping, so looking at signals, um, but trying to understand the trends and the risk typologies that tell us as a platform whether or not the user is bad, right? Um, that judgment is... I don't want to say highly subjective, but it's not foolproof, and it's a work in progress. Um, and we're going to see this both from a human and from a AI perspective. Um, but I think it's going to be very important, even just for looking that we we work with civil society coalitions. We think about legislations that allow platforms to 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 be sort of you know inclusive by design, but like think through the data points they're collecting and like how we can leverage, or not leverage, but like clearly articulate the, the purpose and usage of this, those data points. So hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions from the audience? Wonderful. Any last comments any of you want to, to, to make? All of you? Any of you? <laughs> I'm just going to, excuse me, plus up TEDx uh, campaigns. So if you haven't seen their visual campaigns, they are fantastic. And so I'm very excited that you all are also like taking it to the streets and going out in the community. 
because I think we all do really just like transformative campaigning that many people beyond Paraguay and South America can call. Hopefully it will work uh, that way. Um, we can do a lot of graphics also uh, to reflect on facial recognition technologies and the impacts of those technologies seem right too. Certainly, freely on the streets, etc., etc., etc. Perhaps I think that more than a reflection, I think that also a bit of this panel was, uh, well, the purpose of this panel was to put different processes that are currently um, tackling this issue from a coalition building approach. So, Gab and I are part of the Women's Rights Online Coalition, which is hosted within the Web Foundation but has numerous partners. Uh, civil society partners from the global south and across the world and we're working on different issues and from different perspectives to understand what is only gender-based violence from a better data point of view meaning generating data around the subject in a more unified way also what it means for what is perpetrators what are they where are they how can we better understand them and then also how can we regulate this situation on the gender-based violence from a policy and intervention point of view? And also, how can we better develop evaluation frameworks that can serve uh, tech companies to test how their systems are impacting? And those are all processes that are ongoing at the moment that are participatory as well, because we use this methodology called TPDO, whereby doing this research, but also workshops with different groups of people from across the globe, we get data and we generate a conversation to answer these uh, this questions that we have. So if anyone is interested in that, please feel free to reach me and um, I can include you in those threads and see how you can participate from here until uh, the end of April, where, it's, where we're going to finish this, this process. Yeah, there's a question. Yeah. Thank you for this panel. I'm coming from Turkey, uh, Turkey, uh, Turkey. Uh, I'm a representative of a foundation called Women and Democracy, and we have been organizing biannual uh, summits, international summits. Uh, the last summit was about gender norms. We were trying to tackle the gender uh, norms inherent in all uh, global uh, global um, patriarchy and this year in november we are trying to uh, organize a summit um, uh, focusing on artificial intelligence and women and we have been doing some researches especially in our country uh, when online problems are very much similar with offline problems uh, that's why uh, this panel is very much important, uh, so much important for us, and I would like to be a part of uh, any um, companionship, partnership, and alliance uh, with uh, any and every of your organizations. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And if there are no more questions, then Sadly, we're also out of time. <laughs> I wanted to uh, thank all of you for coming out here and sharing these really important observations. Clearly, there's a lot of work to be done. And clearly, if we don't work together, it's not going to happen effectively. And it's not going to actually mitigate the problem. So thank you for coming together. Not all of us agree on everything, but that's exactly what we need. Right? We need those points of contestation to make us all better. Thank you so much, and thank you for all of you.